all for coming tonight. Um, we are super excited that you were able to join us for this event uh, titled Human Trafficking, a Survivor Success Story featuring Teresa Flores. So thank you, Teresa, for coming. Uh, my name is Ellie Jackson. I'm a current junior at Montana State, and I am also the director of the Heart Initiative. Um, Heart Initiative is a student organization here at MSU that raises awareness about human trafficking in Montana and beyond. Our mission is to foster conscientious awareness of human trafficking occurring in Montana and globally, aid those working towards eliminating trafficking, and to promote a community of compassion and respect. Uh, we do this through collaboration with the Gallatin County Human Trafficking Task Force, presentations, um, and events such as these. Um, I would now like to invite Tara Bradford from um, the chair of the Human Trafficking Task Force to introduce herself and to highlight a little bit about how the task force works locally to combat human trafficking. So Tara, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I want to thank the Heart Initiative for organizing this and Montana State University for facilitating this terrific online event. And thank you, Teresa Flores, for sharing your expertise and your knowledge and your experience with the rest of us. Um, I hold your survivorship um, very sacred. And so thank you for allowing us the privilege of hearing your voice in this particular event. Um, the Gallatin County Human Trafficking Task Force has been in existence for almost three years now. We um, actually work here in the Gallatin Valley to combat and prevent human trafficking in partnership with local nonprofits such as the Heart Initiative, uh, businesses, victim service providers, law enforcement. Um, just anybody in the community who wants to get involved with this issue and um, bring in a collective fight against it in the Gallatin County. <clears throat> we uh, do the bulk of our work in three groups, prevention for education and awareness outreach. And then we also have protection, which provides um, kind of our wraparound services for victims and survivors of human trafficking. And then we have our prosecution, which is our justice stakeholders who uh, work in a multidisciplinary fashion to address cases that come up regarding human trafficking activity. Uh, we have been trying to get back up and running with COVID. We weren't meeting for a while, but we are now um, back online meeting virtually. And so we're really excited to be able to connect back with our community members and uh, get the ball rolling again. So thank you for the event tonight and thanks for everyone who's here. And if you're interested in getting involved with the Gallatin County Human Trafficking Task Force, um, you can go to our website. It's just Gallatin County Human Trafficking Task Force.org. And there's a contact form there that you can complete and um, just reach out and let us know what you need or how you'd like to get involved. Thank you. Some thanks, Tara. Um, so before we welcome Teresa, um, I first like to acknowledge some of our sponsors that um, have sponsored this uh, event tonight. So we'd like to thank the MSU Office of the Dean of Students, the Women's Center, the President's Commission on the Status of University Women, uh, and the Voice Center for partnering with us for this event. Um, I'd also like to thank the Honors Presents team and the MSU Honors College for partnering with us in hosting this event online. So thank you to all of you. Um, and lastly, I'd like to recognize, um, you know, the sensitive nature of the topics that will be discussed during tonight's event. So the MSU Voice Center is staffed by trained advocates available to provide confidential support and resources. Um, so please feel free to call their confidential crisis line if at any point during the presentation tonight you feel like um, you need to call them. So I will put that number in the chat right now so that it's available to you um, throughout tonight's event. Um, so tonight we are pleased to welcome again, Teresa Flores as our keynote speaker. Um, Ms. Flores has been a licensed social worker for over 30 years. 
She received a master's in counseling education from the University of Dayton and a bachelor's of social work from Ball State University. Ms. Flores was appointed to the Ohio State Attorney General's Human Trafficking Commission in 2009 and has testified before the Ohio House and Senate in support of human trafficking legislation. Her efforts were a major part of the success of these bills being passed into laws. Um, the Teresa Flores law was passed in Michigan uh, that eliminates the statute of limitation for children who have been trafficked. A survivor of domestic child sex trafficking herself, she is now the assistant investigator with Global Centurion, researching the mental and physical health problems of over 200 domestic trafficking survivors. She founded the SOAP project in 2010, which she will talk about more, um, and they have given away over a million bars of soap labeled with the National Human Trafficking Hotline number across the nation. Her published works include The Sacred Bath, the Slave Across the Street, and Slavery in the Land of the Free, a Student's Guide to Modern Day Slavery. Um, additionally, she was featured in a short documentary titled The Girl, Girl Next Door, um, which has won many awards at film festivals across the United States. Her story has also been seen on many national and um, television shows, radio and television shows, um, including The Today Show, MSNBC, and CNN. Um, her national rescue mission, SOAP, has been featured on Dateline, Nightline, and America's Most Wanted. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Teresa. Thanks so much, Ellie. Um, I appreciate it so much. I wish I was there in person with it. Everybody. Um, I just love presenting this information and educating audiences on human trafficking, especially from a survivor's perspective. Um, I have a unique perspective, not only being a survivor, but also having a license in social work and a master's in counseling education. So um, uh, I've done a lot, as you can hear, over the last uh, 12 years of this, um, of this fight. Um, when I started doing this, I thought that I would probably be doing this for about two years and then human trafficking would be over. Um, and I was sadly mistaken um, as I don't foresee it really going anywhere in the next 10 years again. But hopefully, you know, we can make as much progress, if not more, in the next 10 years as we have in the last 10 years. Um, I'll tell you that when um, I was uh, in college, you guys, um, I didn't know that I was a survivor. Um, I didn't identify as being trafficked and um, had no idea that those words um, were what linked me to this cause. <clears throat> I thought that trafficking was something that other people in other countries went through. And it wasn't until I went to a conference like this in call after college, I had just graduated with my master's um, and I was at the police department for training on trafficking because I was a social worker, a bilingual social worker. I did home visits and I thought, you know, I should probably know this information for one of my clients. And <clears throat> within five minutes of being in that seat, I realized that that was me. Um, and that was devastating to me because I thought, here I am, 40 years of age. I have a master's. I lived that, and I've never known it was called that. And and it really um, hurt me. But then at the same moment, I felt freedom, a sense of freedom that like, wow, I finally know what to call what happened to me because I never had a word for it. It wasn't just rape. It wasn't just date rape. It wasn't just gang rape. It wasn't just once. It wasn't just 10 times. It wasn't just 10 people. And I never had a word to call it. So going and getting educated about this really set me free. Um, and what has um, just touched my heart over the past 12 years is that when I go and speak, um, almost every time a, a young woman will come up to me and say, me too. And, and they don't real they haven't realized that that was them too. And that starts their healing process as well. 
and we'll talk more about um, what we do with survivors and how we help them along that process. So it's really important that you get educated on this issue, that you pass the information along. You know, go on to Facebook or Instagram tonight, um, follow us on Instagram, and just say, hey, we heard her speak, and let, you know, it's a domino effect, right? And so it's really important that we get this message out. So with that, I think we're gonna start the slides. So hopefully she can get them up and running. Great. And I created this one just for you guys. So if you wanna go to the next one, <clears throat> this is gonna be a fun one. We're gonna go through a little human trafficking 101, um, but then we're also gonna talk about um, what survivors actually go through internally and physically and the road to healing and what it, what it takes for a woman to heal from this. Um, and then I'll share with you my story and kind of what you can do about it too. So one of the problems that we have with trafficking is that people think it looks like this, right? Um, when people find out that I'm a survivor, they're like, oh, were you held in a cage or, you know, with a, in a basement, chained to a bed? Totally inappropriate questions. Let's just start right that. All right. <laughs> Never ask somebody that. Um, but no, none of those things happen to me. Um, you can have internal chains, right? Um, and internal bars to be able to not be able to feel like you can leave. Um, so this is not what generally human trafficking looks like in the United States. At times, small minority, of course, right? But in general, this is not what human trafficking looks like. Go ahead to the next one. All right, and feel free to leave some um, questions and stuff in the chat, and we're going to have a nice time to go over questions later. I think you can go ahead and scan through these. There's about six of them. So let's start with the definition. We've got to start there. Um, the definition of human trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transporting of a person using force, fraud, or coercion for commercial sex or uh, forced labor. <clears throat> really, all it is is if you blackmail somebody, you threaten them, or you manipulate them into forced labor or commercial sex. All right? You don't have to ever lay a hand on them. All right? And they don't actually have to have ever gone anywhere. You can hold a girl in a home and bring men to her, all right? You don't have to have the transportation part, all right? Um, and that can still be human trafficking. Um, we all know about forced labor, about labor trafficking, which you have a lot of in Montana, all right? And the whole area around there. <clears throat> My specialty is called DMST, domestic minor sex trafficking. Domestic meaning American kids, minors a kid, that are trafficked for sexual purposes. So <clears throat> what we need to look at here is the definition of commercial sex. Commercial sex is any sex act in exchange for something of financial value, all right? So if a guy says to a, a young girl, maybe she's homeless, maybe she's on the street, or a boy, hey, you know, I know you need a bed to sleep in tonight. If you do this for me, I'll give you that bed. Or I know you're hungry. Um, if you do this for me, I'll get you this happy meal. Uh, or if you do this, I'll give you some drugs. Those things have a financial value, right? If you exchange any of those things together, if you exchange a financial value for a sexual um, thing, a sexual act, that's commercial sex. So commercial sex can be escorting what we call prostitution, um, stripping can be, not always, but it can be a commercial sex act of exploitation. Um, stripping, like I just said that one. Um, pornography, videos, uh, pictures, things like that are commercial sex. Now, um, if you um, are under the age of 18 and you're involved in any form of those commercial sex things, you, by federal definition, are a human trafficking victim by federal definition. So what that means, and if you don't remember anything I said today, I want you to remember this. What that means is that there's no such thing as child prostitution. Teen prostitutes don't exist. And anytime you see that in the media, 
um, in the news or a newspaper article, um, write the editor, um, write them and tell them, please, you know, change your language because there's no such thing as child prostitution. I hate it when I see <clears throat> this man was arrested and is being tried for child prostitution. For uh, There's no such thing. He was trafficking that child, all right? Um, if you're over the age of 18 and you have a pimp, now a pimp, and we'll get into this more, a pimp can be a boyfriend, right? A parent. Um, if you have somebody that's forcing you into commercial sex and they're benefiting financially off of you, you are being trafficked. So when we go to hotels and stuff and, and we talk to them about prostitution and, and things like that around, and it's like, oh, well, she she has a pimp, you know? It's like, well, she's being trafficked, right? If she has a pimp. Um, physical movement's not required. Uh, smuggling is totally different. Um, if somebody gets smuggled into this country, all right, that is being smuggled. Um, but then what can happen is they are more vulnerable to then becoming trafficked um, where they might, they, the smuggler, the coyote might be like, well, now we got you here, but we're not going to take you where we said we're going to take you. You're going to go work at this farm and pay us even more. So then the, the things get the terms of the deal to change. Um, what I do like to tell people also is that this is not about sex, all right? This is about money and about greed and people doing anything they can for it. And lastly, 80% of all victims are women. This is a women's rights issue, guys. Women's rights issue. Um, it's a women's public health issue as well. And until we deem that nationwide, then nothing's going to change. We have to really promote this as women are being killed. They're being um, uh, uh, murdered. They're I mean, the, I know I'll go into all the things that are happening to women on this. Now, granted, there are 20% that are men and boys that this happens to. And there are not enough services out there for men and boys that are victimized by this as well. And then 50%, uh, we believe, of all victims are children in this issue. Let's go ahead to, to the next one. That was a lot of information on that one. Okay. So different kinds of trafficking, to explain a little bit more, labor in hotels um, as the housekeepers, all right, farming, um, migrant workers, nail salons and spas, um, ones that are open till two o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I've walked into one before and just said, hey, you know, how much is your massage? And I was told $20. I mean, you know, we have Massage Envy here and they do not charge $20 and they're not open at two in the morning. So obviously um, something illicit was going on there. Uh, restaurants, particularly ethnic restaurants, can be places of trafficking, factories, uh, magazine sales, or people that are going door to door. Um, <clears throat> and then you can see the different um, ways that somebody can be sexually trafficked on the right hand side. You can go to the next one. Uh, and there's two right there. So gender, like we said, now this is done by Polaris Project, who is probably the lead organization, them and Shared Hope in the country on human trafficking. Um, and they found, they interviewed survivors. So some of these are interviews with survivors and their answers. So they differ a little bit from what were our national statistics that we, that we have. Um, they found 86 to 12% um, in a, uh, gender wise. We are usually thinking 80, 20% for male and female being trafficked. And then we know that the average age of entry into trafficking in the United States is about 13 years of age. Um, we know this because of all the things that are done on a regular basis. And sometimes they'll find very young children, all right? So that's going to skew um, the numbers here a little bit. <clears throat> Most of the girls that we work with have been trafficked around 15 to 17 years of age as an entry. Um, but I do work with quite a few survivors that were trafficked from a uh, young, very, very young age by their family. So you can see on here um, where the, these fall into between age of zero and 23 is the majority. Go to the next one. Ethnically, racially, um, this knows no bounds. Um, buyers of sex do not care what color skin you, uh, you have. Uh, how big or small you are, what color eyes you have, what color hair you have, they do not care. 
All right, and again, remember, this was done by Polaris Project, um, so it could be a little different in every area that you see. Um, this is a huge issue, uh, obviously, with Native American, um, with Latinos in certain states, you know, our, our more southern states, um, uh, and then our, mig our minority in, in big cities and stuff. So it really it goes across the board of, of ethnicity. Go ahead, next one. Okay, and there's a there. Okay, so why would Montana and and the, the states around you guys, if you're if you're from another state, why would you guys have a lot of human trafficking? Um, this is what the um, Homeland Security has told us. What would make you have a lot of cases at risk for it? Um, extensive highway systems. Okay, obviously you have that in Montana as the you know way to get around. Lots of truck trafficked from your agricultural um, and and so getting you know people from here and there animals all of that so obviously in Montana you have both of those things you can't really get out of the state within two hours of Montana it's a pretty big state so you don't have to worry about that one there's no international borders you do have some universities and colleges and college students are very vulnerable of becoming trafficked no matter where you live um, I firmly believe that Every college needs to have in their freshman orientation at least an hour for students on human trafficking and how to protect yourself from a trafficker and know um, how you're vulnerable. You know, we have drugs and alcohol on campuses, um, you know, just more pros promiscuity. You're not being um, at home with mommy and daddy and having curfew anymore. I mean, if I, and I have kids that are in college right now too, I mean, if they didn't come home from one night, you know, it might take a day or two before their roommate is like, wow, I haven't seen Trey for a while. And then does he have my phone number? Does Trey's roommate, and he does, but like, you know, does your roommate have um, your parents' phone number? Who would they talk, call? If you didn't come home, all right. So these are things that like every university needs to talk to about um, with with students. Really, really important. Um, large immigrant populations, native populations. Obviously, you have that in Montana. Um, they're just more at risk of being trafficked. Military bases. I believe that you have that as well. We know from studies that anytime there's a military base or installment in an area. The demand for sex for sale in that area rises and then strip clubs, um, tourist areas, casinos. Um, you have that where a lot of people are coming to your state right, and then leaving. Um, they're bringing in things. They're doing things there and then leaving. I hope that makes sense. Go to the next one. <clears throat> okay, so specifically. Where is this happening at? All right. Well, really, guys, anywhere kids are, anywhere kids are, this can happen at. Um, we have seen a surge in this happening at public libraries. And you think, like, a library? That's crazy. I used to drop my kids off at the library to go study while I went into the grocery shopping as a single mom. Um, now I wouldn't do that. <clears throat> the, the American Library Association, and this would be a great thing to write a paper on, the American Library Association has um, made a ruling <coughs> that they will not monitor any website, any internet site that um, a participant gets on. And because of that, you can find a lot of articles, um, men particularly, that go there and go on uh, pornographic sites while kids are walking around. Um, it's become a really big problem. Um, malls, obviously, uh, these traffickers really love to go to the malls. And, and they just know who to look for, right? They just know who to hone in on. Um, generally, it might be a, a girl who's like average looking, not beautiful, not ugly, right? Just average. Um, looks like she might have low self-esteem and be by herself, no packages. And a lot of times it's because she just want, doesn't want to be at home. Um, a lot of these kids are um, abused at home. It's over, it's over 80% that are um, actually molested or abused at home that go and get into trafficking, get become trafficked. Um, and so they can just know <clears throat> which kid to just be nice to and say, hey, you have really pretty eyes. It's that simple. 
Um, movie theaters, social media really truly is the number one way. Um, through these chats that the kids are on, the games that they're playing, and they think that they know who's on the other side. Um, and that is the number one way um, that kids, uh, boys and girls, are getting trafficked. Um, they're getting convinced to take nude pictures, send them, and then they're being used against them and blackmailed. Uh, grocery stores. I did a talk. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, where Ohio State is. And I was doing a talk for some Ohio State students. And this girl told me, and she's like a sophomore in college, that she worked at a grocery store in a pretty rural area. <clears throat> and she said, Miss Flores, um, one evening, a lady came through my checkout lane. And she said, you're really pretty. I can make you more money than you make here. And she handed her a business card. She said, but Miss Flores, I had read your book. I knew what that was and I didn't take it. And I was very thankful that, that she didn't know ahead of time what that was. But then I thought, wow, how blatant is this? That these guys are just going to the mall and like talking to girls. That these women, because a trafficker can be a woman as well, are just walking up to somebody in the grocery store. Now, a little challenge for you is to ask you, if you were next in line and you overheard this conversation, what would you have done? What would you have thought of? Like, what would you, what would you have thought was happening? Would you have thought, well, wow, she's offering her a job. <clears throat> would you have thought, hey, this could possibly be a human trafficking, um, you know, situation. What would you have done? Would you have said, hey, can I have that business card too? Now you've got her card. Would you have gone up to the manager of the store and say, hey, I want you to know what just happened, all right? Would we have checked in with that girl and said, hey, good job not taking that? So I want you to start to think about situations like that because you see these things um, all the time and you don't even realize it. Um, <clears throat> that happens in schools. And then the older boyfriend is another big red flag for me. Um, and it was in my situation as well. Um, but a lot of times when we are looking at um, articles of rescues, we see a 14 year old with a 28 year old or a 17 year old with a 40 year old. We see this quite often. And again, <coughs> sorry, nail salons, ethnic restaurants, agricultural areas, truck stops, um, hotels. We really can see this everywhere around us. Go to the next one. There's one more. Yep. Yeah, right. So, oh, back. <laughs> so, how often does it happen? Um, well, a lot of times we think that if you're trafficked, you were kidnapped. I can't tell you how many times, you know, people ask, you know, if I was kidnapped into this. We've all seen the movie Taken, um, and we think that that's how this happens. Um, but that's actually only three percent of the time that they're actually kidnapped into this. All right. Um, 35%, I think is actually closer to 40 some percent are um, tricked or not tricked, are uh, trafficked by family and friends. Uh, I work with a lot of survivors and it's probably about 45% of them were trafficked at a very young age by their father or a stepfather um, <clears throat> and then sold for many, many years. Uh, I was doing a talk, <clears throat> sorry guys. I was doing a talk at a little tiny town um, in the middle of nowhere, and I, I was at a Catholic high school speaking to ninth to 12th graders. And after I shared my story, a ninth grader, so she's 14 years old, comes to me and says, Miss Flores, uh, my mom used to sell me to the landlord to pay the rent. And, you know, it, it's hard to like know what to say when somebody says something like that. And <clears throat> she said, but he's in jail now. And she was all excited and she walked away. But I really wanted to know, like, hey, what happened to her mom? You know, um, a lot of these <clears throat> survivors um, after a while don't continue to have any contact with their family. And we'll talk more about that one later. And then 62% of them um, of the trafficking situations like mine um, are because they got tricked by an older boy, by a cute guy, um, by a girl that they know or a couple in the subdivision. <clears throat> they got tricked or blackmailed into it. You can go to the next one. Okay, so here's some of the red flags. 
<clears throat> if their parents are in drugs or incarcerated, <clears throat> unemployed, um, they just kind of lack that support system. Um, and I have to tell you that even um, if you're rich, you might not have a support system as well, which is what kind of happened and made me vulnerable as well. But these are, you know, you're going to be more vulnerable if you have some of these kids. Kids in the foster care system are so at risk of this. Um, we know that one in seven kids in the foster care system are being trafficked. Um, if a teenager is around that much older guy, he's controlling, um, <clears throat> she's lying about her age or doesn't have an ID, you know, those are some definitely red flags of something going on. I'll go to the next one. Uh, girls with low self-esteem, she has multiple hotel room keys in her purse. Not a good sign for that. Um, lots of cash on her, but I need you to know that like she doesn't keep that cash. <clears throat> she has to turn all of it over to him. All right. Um, she doesn't keep any of it. Multiple prepaid phone cards or self couple different cell phones um, on her. He's bought her a new cell phone. He's bought her new clothes, taking her to get her nails done. She's not hanging around her girlfriends anymore. She's hanging around him and his older friends and partying more. Uh, tattooing <clears throat> branding is very popular in this as well where um, it's very obvious it might be a dollar sign or a barcode, or it might say something like daddy's girl. And especially if she's under age and she's getting a tattoo as well. Go to the next one. So the reality of human trafficking in the United States is that she will have to have sex with at least 10 to 15 men every single night of the week. <clears throat> We're talking seven nights a week, 365 days of the year. There's no sick time. There's no vacation time. Doesn't matter. You know, if you have your monthly, it, it doesn't matter. You are out there every single night. Um, the quota generally in most areas is $800 to maybe $1,500 a night per girl that, ha that he has working for her. So she can't go back to him. He won't pick her up. And so she's made that say thousand dollars, right? He keeps that whole thousand dollars. All right. She will have to do whatever it takes to make that thousand dollars. All right. Um, <clears throat> many times she's beaten. Um, it's extremely violent, which we'll get into. Um, and if she's, if she doesn't bring that money home, then he's going to be very violent with her as well. She has a 40% higher chance of death. Any of you and you most likely, <clears throat> she will die by murder from the John, which is a person that's buying her by the pimp. All right. Or she will commit suicide or die of overdose because she's just so desperate and does not know how to get out of this. Um, we work particularly with uh, minors because the University of Toledo did a study and found that 77% of adult prostitutes were actually trafficked as children. All right. So we know that if we can help get children out of this and prevent it from happening, then they have way less likelihood of becoming an adult prostitute. Um, we also know that um, she, if, she, if she's not saved, all right, she most likely will be involved in the, the court system. She gets arrested over and over again so many times that she has felonies and now she can't get an apartment. She can't get a job, right? Although the, the men who are buying her don't have any penalties. Um, she'll get involved in the social system, social service system. She won't be able to be a good mom. Pretty hard to be a good mom. She'll get have her kids removed from her, um, be on welfare, being in and out of the emergency room, the mental health, the, um, addiction recovery. Uh, it's very, very traumatic. <clears throat> she'll experience post-traumatic stress disorder for the rest of her life. Um, most likely Stockholm syndrome and depression have multiple um, medical needs and, and most likely she won't be rescued from this right I, i'm lucky I, I can tell you no matter how horrible things were for me i'm very very lucky um, because i got rescued out of it um, most are not that lucky go to the next one <clears throat> So like we talked about in violence, and this is part of the research that we did, um, we found that 95% of the 
of all women that were trafficked experienced some form of violent abuse while they were being trafficked. That's huge. You know, we, we think of this as the movie Pretty Woman, right? And it's so fun and everything. It's not. I mean, obviously, you can see from this. Um, they were kicked and beaten, um, forced to have unprotected sex. Um, you know, and I, I do want to talk about that one. <clears throat> so, um, a lot, there's a, a price, right, for however much an act cost. Um, if, you know, her pimp wants her to have the guy wear a condom all the time so she doesn't get pregnant, if a guy comes to her and say, hey, I'll give you an extra $100 if I don't have to wear a condom, she's going to take that because she wants to get back home and she wants to make that quota. So <clears throat> either that or he's just going to force her and rape her um, and make it and make that happen because they feel like they own you for that hour that they bought you. Um, you see on here strangled strangulation is huge. And this isn't one for, especially for like forensic nursing, um, because it's a, a sense of control and power where they, they take you to almost death and then bring you back. And the last one's really important on here too. abused by a person of authority. I want you to think for a second, what do you think that that is? Or who do you think that is? If you could enter the chat box, it'd be awesome. Who do you think a person of authority would be? Now, 50% have experienced that. So we interviewed 200, uh, other than this one, it was 100, uh, this, <clears throat> this one here. So over 50% were abused by a person of authority. I see this <clears throat> coming in, great. Um, parent, yeah, but definitely can be a parent um, and a pimp. A, yes, father. I love how somebody said cops, question mark. You're exactly right. Um, a lot of, and teacher, exactly. A lot of um, survivors will tell you that they were um, also um, bought and used by cops. Um, and the pimps do this um, on purpose, all right? Um, to be able to control her and tell her you can't go to anybody, you know, they're not going to trust you. They don't, they're not going to help you. Yeah. I see religious leader on there. Exactly. So, um, can you imagine what that does to your brain when you're brought up as a kid thinking, Oh, a person of authority, I can go to somebody that can help me. Well, this, these pimps do this on purpose. Um, and so do the people that are trafficking them go to the next one. Physical problems, and again, this is from our research that we did, 99% of all survivors um, experienced some sort of physical, excuse me, physical problem, neurological problems, all right? So that's from being hit in the head, all right? Concussions, you know, athletes have nothing on concussions like survivors of trafficking jail. Um, they're being beaten every single day. <clears throat> um, when we interview them, um, they are in trauma mode, right? Um, they're, um, they're just, um, they've been beaten usually. And, and we're asking them all these questions. What happened to you? Um, how can we help you? Um, uh, you know, and, and she can't even begin to answer. She can't remember. And that's because of the neurological problems. And a lot of times what happens in medical facilities is then they just don't believe her. They think she's lying. Um, and that's really, really unfortunate about how, um, survivors get treated in medical facilities. <clears throat> We're trying to really hard to change that. Gastrointestinal problems, 62% have. Um, this is one of my, my favorite areas to tell people, um, probably because I have an extreme amount of gastrointestinal problems. I've had uh, esophagus surgery twice. And <clears throat> this is, you would think unusual, but you think about when you were a kid, and you were in, in a nervous situation and you got butterflies in your stomach, right? Or when you're about ready to take a test and you know you're not ready and you, you know, you don't feel good, your tummy hurts. Um, if, if a car, a cop pulled you over, you'd be like, oh gosh, you know, that's stress, right? That is stress induced and our body reacts to stress and our stomachs really react to it, right? Um, and, and it's amazing because it actually our stomachs um, kick up uh, enzymes, like mucus enzymes, and they start going crazy. And then they come back up your esophagus, all right? Um, and they cause like you know, heartburn, right? That's how we get a heartburn. Um, but can you imagine laying in a motel room, 
right? And every half hour to hour, a different man walks through that motel room. You don't know if he's going to be nice. You don't know if he's going to be a weirdo, be violent. You have no idea every half hour to hour what's going to walk in through that door. Can you imagine what that does for stress on your body? Um, and then we see the last one, dental problems. When you have so much acid coming up from you, from your body, from the stress, um, it actually can eat away the and erode your the um, enamel of your teeth, all right? The other reason we have uh, dental issues on here too is many, many survivors are missing teeth. Um, they get um, hit in the mouth and um, I know so many that are need and huge need of dental help because they um, have uh, no teeth whatsoever. They're not brushing their teeth, you know, twice a day, even at once a day, not eating nutritional meals while they were being trafficked. So you can see how these things could really affect a person's um, health. Go to the next one. Obviously, we need to talk about substance abuse if we're talking about trafficking. If you have a substance abuse area in your town, you have a human trafficking problem. They go hand in hand. And now this was done a couple years ago. Um, I think that we should redo this. I'm really wanting to redo this, um, su this survey. Um, I think that this would look a lot different today than it was even, you know, four years ago. Um, I, so obviously, um, 85, almost 85% of all trafficking victims are using some sort of app, um, substance abuse. It's either because they're being forced to by the pimp so he can control them or because they're doing it to numb the pain of what they're having to go through. <clears throat> um, alcohol and marijuana were the highest on here that's easily obtainable, um, not super addictive compared to the others, right? But today, I believe that heroin, meth, those kinds of things would be much higher on this list. Um, and it just, um, so a lot of times what happens is <clears throat> she gets addicted, he kicks her to the curb, um, and then she starts doing uh, prostitution on her own on the street so that she can get her drugs, all right? So then people think she's just a drug hoe. She's just doing it for the drugs, but they don't know what happened to her prior to that to make it this situation. Go to the next one. So this is one of the um, ones that people just don't get. And, and, I, and I hope that you do after this. Um, a lot of people, uh, even after hearing my story, will come up to me and say, look, why didn't you tell? Why didn't you just tell your mom and dad? Why didn't you just tell that policeman? And, and it's not that easy. People don't understand that just because he doesn't have a gun to your head doesn't mean that you can run away. Um, and so this is really, really important for you to understand the mindset um, of, what, uh, of what this does to a victim. Uh, sometimes the women are held in captivity, all right? I was taken to beautiful, large homes in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, and I had no idea where I was. Had I even escaped there, all right, um, I would be probably would have been walking down the street and no idea where I was. What was I supposed to do? Right? So a lot of times they can be held in captivity, confined and just not know where they are. Uh, and they're definitely frequently guarded all the time. This is, this is true for everybody. They are watching you 100% of the time and they let you know that, um, they let you know that they're watching your family and they threaten you with that. Um, they will use threats of violence, like, I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to do this. They don't even have to, but they will threaten that. Um, I think every situation of every survivor that I know, the trafficker threatens one of their loved ones. <clears throat> um, that was a case for myself as well. Um, you know, we're watching your family, we know where, where your dad is at, um, <clears throat> we're going to hurt your brothers. So, fear isn't even the correct word. Um, fear afraid. Uh, there's no word in the English dictionary that can explain to you that feeling of what these guys instill. It's like being in a cult. Um, these guys are mastermind terrorists uh, and they know exactly how to get you. They know your vulnerabilities and how to use them against you. 
Um, unfortunately, a lot of survivors feel shame and blame that they allowed this to happen to themselves. And I think that that's the, the one that the hardest one that we have on working with survivors is that um, to try and prove to them that they are worthy, that they didn't allow this to happen. Many times they were children and somebody did this to them. So this, um, this psychological trauma and the self-blame are so hard to help repair in a woman. Um, and sometimes, like I told you before, I, I did not identify as a trafficking survivor. Uh, I didn't know that that was what <clears throat> was called. Um, and some, especially that are trafficked by family members, have grown up with it, and they just think this is what happens in every family, unfortunately. Go to the next one. Again, um, why they don't tell. Um, sometimes they are bonded to a trafficker. That is called Stockholm Syndrome, <clears throat> where you... Um, you fall in love and they, and they do this intentionally. You fall in love with that trafficker. <clears throat> I know that if I were to see my trafficker again tomorrow, um, and he said, Hey, let's go and have a cup of coffee. Let's go talk. I would go. Um, even at 55 years of age, I know that I'm still, I still have a bond there. And, and those are things that are very difficult, if not impossible to break, unfortunately. Um, again, they don't trust the, the um, law enforcement um, because of the, um, the things that we talked about before. Um, they just feel hopeless. They're addicted. They just don't have any idea what to do to get out of it. Um, and that's what causes the suicides and the uh, overdoses. Go to the next one. So, um, you know, in our country, we think of prostitution as a choice that somebody makes, that it's fun and great, and there's TV shows about it, movies about it, right? Um, we think that it's a victimless crime, right? We think that it's the, the world's oldest um, profession. Uh, nothing uh, burns me more than to hear that, right? It is actually um, a, a crime against women, right? And it actually is the oldest oppression of women. Uh, and that's what we need to get out to society. We need to make society realize that this is unacceptable um, morally, socially, um, <clears throat> in every way. You know, we see this lady on the right hand side and her sign says, tired of prostitution, need money, please help. Um, what probably happened is maybe she was being abused at home, um, met this older guy, and he said, you're pretty, you know, come away with me, I'll take care of you, I love you, started buying her things, and she's like, why not, you know, my life sucks here at home, okay, she runs away with him at 15, and then he says, hey, <clears throat> now you owe me, you know, I've been putting money into you, and now you need to get out there and work for me. She can't believe what's happening, right? <clears throat> and she's being raped over and over again. He gives her drugs, right? And then you see her seven, seven years later. You can usually last in this life about seven years. He kicks her to the curb because he wants younger, fresher meat <clears throat> for his clients. And here she finds herself with no money, right? She didn't get to keep any of that money. Probably addicted to drugs. She doesn't have a driver's license. She didn't get to go to driver's ed. No birth certificate, no social security card, no bank account, nothing to put on an application even to go to McDonald's and look for a job. She's never worked a job, right? <clears throat> What's she supposed to do? You know, this is what we see over and over again. She probably has a record for being arrested over and over again as well. Um, this, is, this is what we see in our country and we call it prostitution, but it's started off as human trafficking um, and this is where we need to change our um, our laws and everything about this go to the next one so this is probably the most important slide that i have for you um these are the five components of human trafficking all right um and there is an answer to this which one of these do you think and you can put these in the chat which one of these do you think that we can remove and it comes crashing down. <clears throat> it would finally solve the problem of slavery in our country once and for all, all right? 
Oh, I love your answers. Those are great. So let's start with the exploiter, the trafficker. We don't know a whole lot about a trafficker. Like what makes him wake up one morning and say, I'm going to go sell human beings. We don't really know a whole lot. Most likely he was raised in a family of violence, maybe drugs, um, um, like guns, things like that, right? Um, but he feels like he can go and make a lot of money off selling women. Maybe he's seen this before. Um, and we do know, though, that he doesn't, he doesn't, um, I don't want to say appreciate, he doesn't um, believe in human rights. He doesn't honor the fact of a, of a woman, all right? Um, I'm not saying that right. Sorry, I can't figure out my words on that one. So he knows that there's low risk, all right, and high profits to being a trafficker, right? How many times do you see it in the news that a trafficker was arrested, put away, right? Not very often, all right? So low risks, high profits. He can usually make about $300,000 a year from one person working for him. And they usually have about four girls working for them, right? Um, he has a higher chance of going to prison for drug trafficking than he does human trafficking. Now, what does that say about our country? That we are putting away people for drug trafficking at a much, much higher rate than human trafficking, right? So what he's going to do is he's going to go find a groomer, a recruiter, a cuter boy, um, a girl, and he's going to say, hey, go find me some um, victims and I'll cut you in on this because he knows he could get arrested and he doesn't want to. <clears throat> so the recruiter's like, OK, and they go and they find victims. There is no amount of programs out there of soap that we have. There's no amount of anything <clears throat> law enforcement in our country that can go after all the victims out there. It is impossible. <clears throat> we know that there are hundreds of thousands of victims in the United States of human trafficking. All right. Um, the victims don't even have to go and the recruiter, the exploiter, they don't even have to go looking for the customer. The customer comes looking for them. All right. <clears throat> the only way to stop human trafficking, the only way in the United States is to go after the demand, the demand for sex for sale. All right which means the customer also. So um, in our country, it is illegal to buy sex for sale, except for in eight counties, all right, in the entire United States, 300,000 counties, eight counties are legal, but <clears throat> um, so it is illegal to buy and sell another person, all right? But 90% of all arrests of prostitution are of the female, 90%. They're not going after the buyer, right? The customer. If they started to do that, we would change everything. <clears throat> if communities said, you know what? We love our children. We love our women in this community. We wanna protect them. We wanna make sure nothing happens and keeps our, our, our town safe. Um, if you get caught buying another person in our county, you know, you're going to have to pay a $5,000 fine. In most places, guys, it's $150,000, $150 misdemeanor fine if you get caught. And that's if you get caught. Usually the police aren't even going looking for customers, all right? They don't typically do that unless it's on a big sting. So if the police went out nightly, all right, and said, we're here to protect our communities, keep them safe. And if you get caught, <clears throat> you know, buying another person, that's slavery. If buying another person, then you're going to go to jail. Um, if we started to do that regularly, then I know that we could change this. Um, actually, it's called the Nordic model. There's also another one called the equality model, um, very similar where instead of arresting the woman selling herself, because some people feel like if it's your body, if you want to sell yourself, you should be entitled to do that, okay? But you shouldn't be able to buy another person, all right? So um, a lot of countries are going towards this model and seeing great success. Of violence against women is dropping drastically, um, and it's making a big difference. Um, it's something that I wish every community, every state would have in the United States. Um, but unfortunately, there's a town in uh, Michigan, Ann Arbor, where University of Michigan and Eastern Michigan State are at. And they just had a new prosecutor come in. And he, his first ordinance 
into office was that he is going their office will turn the other eye um, and not arrest women who are selling or men who are purchasing basically saying it's legal all right prostitution is legal in our in our county all right so what happens with the state troopers what happens with the city police you know this is a county thing what happens with the uh, sheriff's department basically he's saying you know we're legalizing prostitution all right this is happening all across the country all right um, and we need to take a stance against it i hope that makes sense go to the next one so you know, when we first started off, we looked at what um, people think of as a uh, human trafficking victim in the cage. Um, well, you see the guy in the middle, and that's what we think a pimp looks like, and sometimes they do. Um, this is actually a book on Amazon. Uh, it's $450, and it tells you all how to be a pimp, all right? Um, but the guy on the left is really definitely was a pimp, all right? He was known to have sex up to 14 times a day with minors. Um, and what infuriates me is that people knew that this was happening. People knew, um, high profile people, and even if they weren't participating while they went to his place, his island or wherever, even if they weren't participating, they are accessories to this because they knew this was going on and never did anything. Um, the guy on the right is Robert Kraft, owner of the Patriots. He got caught going into massage parlors in Florida, um, was not receiving just massages, um, and got a slap on the hands and let go. Um, these are kinds of the things that we need to start to change so that we can help protect women. Go to the next one. Uh, traffickers, we're just going to go over this really fast. Traffickers can be anybody, can be females as well. Um, and the purchasers generally are men, middle-aged men, but a female can be a purchaser. Um, and people that are addicted to pornography, uh, it can be anybody. As you can see, a trafficker, a, a John, can be anybody. Go to the next one. I'm gonna skip, let's skip this one. Um, so, like I said before, 90% of all prostitution arrests are of the female, and yet it's illegal to buy a person. Uh, very few uh, states have what are called John schools, where a guy is arrested and then has to go through an educational program. Um, they are very successful. Um, and what is needed is not legalization of prostitution, but decriminalization. Um, and that means decrim, like making women um, not being criminals for doing this, but making the purchase of it illegal. Go to the next one. Pornography, we're just going to skip over this one real fast, not skip over, but we're just going to go this one real fast. Um, we, if you're talking about human trafficking, you have to talk about pornography. Um, huge addictions of, of pornography in this country in the past year, it has skyrocketed even with children um, being on the computers all, all over the place. The United States is the largest purchaser of pornography. Um, Playboy.com gets 4,000 hits per minute. I wish the Soap Project website got 4,000 hits per minute, right? Um, this one is old. This says uh, from 2006, 11 years of age was their first internet porn exposure. I'm sure it's much, much younger than that now. Go to the next one. So a part of the SOAP project, we look for missing kids um, and missing women around the country, especially during big sporting events. And I found this young lady in Columbus, Ohio, prior to the Columbus Marathon. Um, and on the ad, this was when Backpage was up and running. And now there's just different ones instead. Um, on, on this ad, it says uh, she was 23 and she was $150 an hour. Now, People will say, well, she posted this online of herself. She's selling herself. Absolutely not. That's a lie. All right. Somebody's taking her pictures. She doesn't look very happy doing this. And imagine what happened is her parents probably took her to get this picture on the top taken, and she probably posted it on Facebook. And somebody just said, hey, you're really pretty, you know, and started talking to her. That's that easy, right? 
um, had her meet him somewhere and then never got to go back home. Um, and you can see that um, it, it's very, she, she probably looks like she's maybe what, 13, 14 years old. Go to the next one. I found her again a year later in Columbus, uh, it said she was 24 now. Um, <clears throat> seriously, she looks probably like no more than 16 here. Um, looks probably a little wigged out on drugs. Again, somebody else is taking her picture. Doesn't look happy about it. But this is human trafficking, you guys. This is what it looks like in the United States. We just misname it. We call it teen prostitution. And that's a horrible, horrible thing that we have done. Um, because we put the blame on her. Go to the next one. I found these two uh, pictures on Backpage.com again um, in different cities. Uh, look very, very young. One you can tell is in a hotel. Um, she looks like she might even be pregnant. You get more money <clears throat> by weirdos if you're pregnant. There's a lot of weirdos out there. Um, but she looks like she's smiling. So people might say, oh, well, she's a willing participant. You know, again, she's probably 15 years old. All right. Um, and in a hotel room. And, and this is part of what we do at the SOAP project is we, we look for kids like this um, and we help um, the hotels and the motels rescue them. Go to the next one. And this is why I do what I do. Um, you know, seven days a week, um, it doesn't matter um, what, if anybody's asked me to, to share this information, I will. Um, it's for it's for this reason. Um, the girl in the upper left hand corner, uh, her name is Grace, <clears throat> and she looks like she could be me back in the day, right? Um, she is 15 there, and I think just precious. Unfortunately, these are all pictures of Grace um, from the time she was 15 until that last one taken in the lower right hand corner, or she was 17 years old. All right, these are all photos of Grace. These are actually all mug shots of Grace from every time she was arrested for prostitution. Now, we failed Grace. We failed her. This is why I do what I do, because we didn't help her. And, and that's just not acceptable to me. I mean, look at her. She was arrested for prostitution, 15, 16, 17. Does it look like she wants to do this? That's what we think about prostitution, that they're choosing to do it. Or does it look like somebody's doing this to her? What do you think that she's going through? What do you think she's experiencing? If she'd been a friend of yours in high school, well, and you saw this change in her, obviously she's being beaten. You can see that. She's got some teeth loss there, probably from drugs or being beaten. Uh, poor hygiene, probably smells, probably hasn't taken a shower, hasn't eaten. And look at this, the despair on her face. This is unacceptable. This is what women are going through in our country. And we've misnamed it prostitution. And we arrest them. And, and this should not ever happen again. Go to the next one, please. So um, it really is hard for me to look at Grace's pictures, like I said, because it does, does the first one remind me of myself. Um, I was a normal kid growing up in the Midwest. I have three younger, really annoying brothers. They're still annoying. Uh, and I had a mom and a dad. My dad did not molest me. I wasn't beaten. I didn't do drugs. I wasn't a runaway. Um, I wasn't promiscuous. I was a good kid. And uh, I grew up in a normal family. And yet that didn't even exempt me from what was going to happen to me um, when I got to high school. Um, what made my family a little different than most families is that we moved every two years because of my dad's job. Uh, he worked as a in a big company, <clears throat> and he would get promoted and transferred every two years. So I was always the new kid, always trying to fit in, and that really stunk. You know, I would try and like have people like me, and then learn their lingo and then be gone again. And 
Um, so my brothers and I were pretty close. Um, we went camping all the time as a family. Uh, we traveled all around in the summers and had nice big houses and, um, you know, it was a fun life. It just was, it was just different than most people's life. I didn't have like grandparents and aunts and uncles that lived by me that would be like, Teresa, you're acting a little different. You know, let's, let's go out for some ice cream and talk. Um, I didn't know anybody hardly at all anywhere I went. Uh, I didn't have the same doctor. Uh, you know, obviously didn't live in the same house. I didn't, um, I, I don't know anybody from kindergarten. I mean, the oldest friend that I have is from my senior year of high school. I don't know people and they don't know, they didn't know me. So that's what really made me vulnerable. And I would say like have low self-esteem too, and was just starved for attention as well. Go to the next one. So um, we, like I said, we moved all over the place from all over Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, um, and the middle of my freshman year of high school, we moved from this really rural area in the middle of the state to a um, suburb, really rich suburb outside of Detroit, Michigan. It was so different. It was like nothing I had ever experienced before. Fast pace. Um, all the, the people in the school were really rich. They wore designer clothes, um, which was important to them and um, ethnically diverse. And, and like I said, nothing I had ever experienced, but I liked it. I thought this is really great. This is cool. Um, but it was really hard again to move in the middle of my freshman year of high school. That was really super tough. And um, it was pretty soon um, I met a boy. And it always starts out like that. You know, I met this cute boy who went to school with me. He was different. He wasn't like the normal boys that I grew up with. You know, most of the guys I grew up with, I'm sure you're going to appreciate this. You know, we, we go dirt bike riding, go ice skating on our pond. You know, they wore jeans they'd go hunting every fall. This guy was not like that. He wore slacks to school that were pressed with the line down the middle. He wore gold chains and perf you know, perfume, cologne. Um, nobody that I had ever met was like that as a boy in my school. He was a couple years older, but he was in my grade. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is really great. He's paying a lot of attention to me. He would ask me if I, he wanted to you know, walk me to class. Uh, he worked in the bookstore and I would find any excuse to go in. Um, but my friends didn't like him. They said, like, we're in two different cliques. If you want to be friends with us, you can't go out with him. And I really, really just wanted friends at that point. So I was like, okay. But that didn't stop me having a crush on him. And um, pretty soon he started to call my house. Now, I, uh, my parents were very, very strict. We were Irish Catholic. I'm the only girl, all right? My parents had a lot of strict rules. I wasn't allowed to um, date until I was 16 and could drive a car. And so my dad wouldn't even let boys call the house until I was 16. And I thought this was just so mean, you know? And so six months went by of every time I turned around, he was there just smiling and giving me compliments. And it was February of my sophomore year of high school. And I, um, I stayed after school cause I was on the track team. And um, I ran to my locker to get something and he was standing right by my locker. And he said, Teresa, would you like a ride home from school? And I was like, wow, this is great. I wasn't ready to go home from school, but this is great. It's not a date. It's just a ride home from school. I was like, okay, great. And so we go out to his car, which was a brand new black Trans Am. It was a hot, hot car. And we get in and I'm like, this is awesome. And he pulls out of the parking lot of the high school and he turns right, but I lived left. I'm like, wait, 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 I live this way. And he said, oh, I know, but I just have to run home and grab something I forgot. Now, red flags went off in my head because my parents had had lots of conversations with me. But then I thought, Teresa, you're being silly. This, you know, this guy, it's not a stranger. You go to the same school as he does. You go to the same church as he does. It's fine. So I ignored all those warning signs. And we went up to his house, which was even larger than mine. And he said, hey, would you like to come in? I just need to grab something I forgot. 
And that day I said everything my parents had taught me. I said, no, 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 I need to get home. My mom's waiting for me. But after all these compliments, after all these smiles and everything, my life changed with three words. He said, I like you. That's all it took. I was like, oh, okay. And I went in. I thought everything would be okay. He showed me around the house. He gave me a pop. I thought that was really nice. Unfortunately, that pop was laced with And that afternoon, I got drugged and raped. When he took me home that afternoon, um, I made another big, dis uh, big mistake. I decided not to tell my mom. Um, and that changed um, everything for me, too. Because I thought that my mom would be angry at me that I went with this boy and I shouldn't have. I thought she would be disappointed in me because um, back in those days, being a virgin until you got married was really important. I thought she'd be disappointed um, in me, me, angry, just see me differently, see me dirty, you know. And I thought, I'm not going to say a word. I'm going to keep this to myself. Here I am battling with the fact that my virginity just was stolen from me, right? That's not bad enough, but now I feel like I can't even tell my parents. Um, and had I, everything in my life would have changed, right? So I decided I'll just deal with this on my own. And on Monday, I went back to school and um, he came up to me and he said, I need to speak to you. Uh, and that was the last thing that I wanted to do, but it wasn't a question. He said, um, I have something to show you. And he had an envelope in his hands that were full of pictures that looked totally different than what actually happened. Um, today, this would be sexting. And he said, uh, my cousins were there, They're, they were older and they took these and they have a plan. And that plan is that you're going to earn them back or else. I had no idea what he meant. I was very naive. I thought it meant like wash the car, you know, work in their store, do their homework. And he said, no, um, we know where your dad works. This is the name of his boss, the address of his office. Uh, we're going to share these with your, his boss. There was no way. He said, we're gonna post these all around school where you're new. There was no way. And then he said, we're going to show these to the priest at church. Again, no way, you know. And <clears throat> so I was like, okay, I'll do whatever it takes, not knowing what they ha had entailed for me. So around midnight, they would call my house. I had my own private phone, and they would demand that I sneak out and appear immediately for service. Uh, I would go in my pajamas and barefoot, and it was super easy in my house to sneak out because my parents slept with the bedroom doors shut all the time. And I would go down the stairs um, to the family room to the sliding glass door and go out it, and I would just leave the, the sliding glass door open an inch. And I would run through my backyard, through the neighbor's backyard, and wait for that Trans Am. Um, they would take me, like I said, to beautiful houses all around the Detroit area where they delivered me like a pizza to men. And I would have to do whatever they said for hours until they were finished. And then they would take me back home again uh, around three or four in the morning. And I would sneak back inside and go to bed for a few hours and go to school the next day and do it all over again. Nobody had any idea something like that was happening to a kid like me. You know, they saw what they wanted to see, but I changed. You know, I was, became very withdrawn and jumpy and depressed. My grades dropped. Um, I, I didn't want to go to school. I had stomach aches all the time and migraines. I mean, there was definitely red flags, but people just thought I was having a hard time adjusting to the new area. And I wasn't talking. You see, they threatened to kill my family. They followed me and my little brothers home from school every day. Uh, I worked at Burger King on the weekends and they would come in and just stand there and watch me. If I was babysitting, they would call and say, hey, we know where you're at. Um, so it's like living in a horror movie and you have no idea how to get out. I remember one night being in some house somewhere and I was naked and laying on a bed. And my trafficker walked through the door with this older man. And he said something to me nobody had ever said. He said, 
What's your name? Nobody had ever asked me that because they don't care. I didn't answer him because we're not permitted to speak. And he looked at the trafficker and said, hey, what's your name? And the trafficker just laughed and said, what does it matter? She has no name. Now to hear that, that will literally break your soul into pieces. I remember trying really hard not to cry. And then he did something else nobody had ever done. He said, never mind, I've changed my mind. And he walked out. Now on one hand, I was ecstatic because I could go home and go to bed. But on the other hand, I was devastated because I thought, wow, why didn't he ask me, how old are you? Do you want to be here? Can I get you out of here? But he didn't know. He didn't know that I wasn't doing this by choice. He didn't know that these guys were forcing me and selling me. That's the sort of stuff that needs to change. For two years, this continued to happen, right? And I had no idea how to get out of this. Go to the next one. On my uh, worst night, yeah, good, yeah, thank you. On my worst night, I was kidnapped actually and uh, taken to a little motel in the inner city Detroit where I was beaten and drugged. Um, they took me out of the car by my hair and threw me into this tiny motel room where over two dozen men waited for me. Over 20 men in a tiny motel room. I was the only female, 16 years old. They auctioned me off to the highest bidder that night over and over again until I passed out. The next morning I woke up and I was all alone and I threw up from the drugs and I decided that something had to change, that I could not have my story end like this. And I found my pajamas and I put them on and I just started walking around the parking lot of this inner city Detroit. Instinctively, I think I knew that I would never see my family again. You know, it was morning. It was like five in the morning. I knew my mom and dad would be waking up soon and they hadn't come back to get me. Either they weren't coming for me or they were gonna come for me later and take me somewhere else and I was never going to see my family again. And instinctively, I knew that that's not how I wanted this to end, but I had no idea how to get out of it. So I just stumbled around the parking lot. Here I was 16 with just pajamas on, no shoes, no money, not even a penny, no identification on me, no idea where I was. Talk about despair. No person should ever have to know that. I walked into this little diner, this little 24 hour diner that was attached to the motel and um, something changed. I met an angel. Uh, I met an angel who saved my life. It was this old black lady pouring coffee to homeless men in the middle of the inner city Detroit diner. She took one look at me and she knew the signs of a kid in trouble. And she said something to me nobody ever said. No teacher, no coach, no neighbor, no friend. She said, can I help you? Wow. Can I help you? Wow, nobody ever asked me that. And that morning she called the police and they brought me home. And that's not how my story ends, but it changed. And I was able to escape several months after that uh, across the country and start my life over. So 10 years ago, I created the SOAP project, Save Our Adolescents from Prostitution. When I finally found out that what happened to me was called human trafficking. And I realized that there's still a lot of traces out there at those motels and graces. And I decided that that wasn't, that wasn't acceptable. So I created SOAP, and you can go to the next one. And we get volunteers to help us all across the country label bars of soap and makeup remover wipes with these red labels and the National Human Trafficking Hotline number on them. And then we take them to hotels and motels all around the country with missing children and missing girl uh, women posters. 
and we asked hotels, have you seen her? You know, can you put these soaps in the in the room where she might see them and she can take that label off? And, and a, mir a miracle has happened with this. Um, she calls that number, the calls to the hotline, which is Polaris Project Double, anytime we're in an area. We've now given away 2 million bars of soap across the country in the past 10 years. Um, we were at the Super Bowl as we go every year um, in uh, January, and we have 16 missing uh, girls on our poster, and five of them were rescued that weekend. Um, they call, they're, they're identified, and, and it's amazing how just a tiny bar of soap can, can help somebody. You know, there was no human trafficking hotline number when I was being trafficked. It didn't exist, right? I wish that I'd had somebody just to talk to, uh, and now they do, but they don't know it. They don't know they're being trafficked. So um, these are a key. This is the only, one of like the only pro programs in the country like it. Um, and it's something that we're hoping to do in every single state um, within the next two years. You can go to the next one. So we do soap because we know 80% of the time of trafficking is happening at hotels. You know, it used to be street walkers, right? And, and people on the, you know, walking down the big cities, right? It's happening in hotels and motels now. That's where it's happening at. A lot of time there are happening because of businessmen that are traveling to an area and working. When we were looking on backpage.com for girls that were being sold, Sunday and Monday nights were the, the biggest number of uh, women being sold on on backpage.com. So, um, and sometimes, and the traffickers actually house the women. They go from city to city to city, right? <clears throat> and they stay in hotels. So that's why we do these at hotels. Go to the next one. And we take them to nice hotels and we take them to skanky hotels and motels. It doesn't matter. Um, we're trying to figure out a way to get them into campgrounds as well. This is a picture of the Super Bowl in Miami. We had 400 people. It's great because teenagers, kids can come out. I've had a four-year-old come out and help label soaps, you know, 90-year-old uh, uh, retired nuns. Um, and they're all trained, right? They all get an education um, similar to this on human trafficking so they know what to look for when they go out. Go to the next one. So, well, this was a, a really amazing thing. There's one more, yeah. Is that, you know, a lot of survivors will tell you they were at hotels, they were at motels, and, you know, how come that nobody helped me, right? Um, and this person said here, I was a child spending a lot of time at a specific hotel for little years, and nobody ever asked me a question. Nobody ever asked the police. You know, this really resonates with me because I ran through my neighbor's yard several times a week for two years he saw me he'd be sitting in the living room watching tv at midnight and see me in my pajamas and bare feet run across his backyard where did he think that i was going uh, partying in my pajamas right he never said anything to my parents and had he my situation might have been completely different go to the next one so now we're going to get to the fun part here so we work with survivors um, of human trafficking and we hold retreats. We have support groups um, for them as well. We do emergency services funds for them. Um, and this is, they have a hard, hard time of healing. It takes a lifetime. It's not something that you get over, believe me. Um, but a lot of times they don't know who they are um, because this became all of who they were, all right? Um, society says one thing about, about women like this, right? And so it's very diffi difficult um, with your identity, um, especially when you've been in trauma. <clears throat> one of the things that I tell the ladies is that, you know, this is just one piece of who you are, all right? When you've had trauma happen to you, it's just one small piece of you. Um, and moving past that trauma is really important. Go to the next one. Okay, so we, like I said, hold retreats uh, for survivors of trafficking all across the country. Would love to have one in Montana. Um, and we generally have about 24 um, new survivors, new meaning that they've never been to a retreat. And then we have about six returnees as mentors. Um, we have a, a two to one ratio of volunteers as well. Um, and one of the favorite things is they do a drum circle. Um, it's a great way for meditation. They sing, they dance, they, they come.
come together um, and it's a really they you know get their aggregate their aggr their aggression out on it. Um, but the drum circle is one of their most favorite things that they do. Um, and I'm going to show you some really cool pictures of the things that we do at the retreats. Go to the next one. And so it's really, really important to refill their heart and soul. A lot of them have never been a child before. Um, and so um, they really important plane. A lot of them don't have basic living skills because like I said, they ran away from very early. They don't know how to write a thank you card, things like that. So we work on healing the mind. Um, everything is trauma informed. We have a counselor on staff that helps. There's uh, usually several counselors. All right, um, we have sessions, we have classes, kind of like a conference where you sign up for different things. Um, and survivor mentorship has become really important in it as well. Survivors who have kind of graduated from our retreats then come back um, to help the other ones along. And we talk about, we, we heal the body. Uh, we have massages, super, super important. Massages, facials, Reiki, um, and a lot of them, 99% have never had a massage, right? Healthy touch is very, very important. Um, and knowing how to, um, to, to feel good and pour into yourself and be okay with that. So um, physical, and we have uh, sessions by a nurse um, on, you know, trauma in your body and what happens with that. Um, and so that's, we also have like the nurses on staff all the time as well. And then healing the soul, very important. We talk about, like I said, worthiness and self-love. Um, and uh, we do a lot of spiritual work. These are not Christian. Uh, they are non-denominational. Uh, we have people from every walk of life and we accept them from right where they are. And that is very, very important to me as well. And we talk about healthy relationships. Um, you know, how do you get married again or ever? You know, how you have children. How do you be a good mom when you've been trafficked? How do you ever have a healthy sexual relationship? You know, our, our more advanced retreats, we talk about that kind of stuff because nobody's talking about it to them. Go to the next one. Um, and one of their favorite things to do is their high tea. It's a surprise. And we have three ladies from Cleveland that bake everything. They collect teacups year round at different thrift stores. And each lady gets to take her teacup and saucer home with them. Um, I mean, they have, you know, at times rose petals on the, the tables, fresh flowers. They are served the tea. So the women come around, um, everything from a honey stick to uh, sugar cubes. They've, they've never done anything like this before. Um, and it's the highlight for them. Um, it, it pleases me so much when I see pictures of a survivor go home and then do this with their child. Go to the next one. Um, so these are some things if you work with survivors or if you are uh, interested in working with survivors, really important. We need way more sort resources out there and services for them. Um, but people need to be trauma informed and trained. All right. It's really very important to be trained by a therapist on how to work with survivors. Um, unfortunately, we see too many people that are like, oh, I have an extra bed in my house. You know, I'll take a survivor. Uh, that can be very damaging for all parties and, you know, involved. So you really have to be trained in this. Uh, it's very important for them to receive different kinds of therapy, including basic living skills and have a support system um, and healthy boundaries. So these are really, really important things to where you start at. Go to the next one. So uh, uh, again, with body and soul, this was Tai Chi. We always offer yoga. Uh, we like to do, you know, like Reiki and Tai Chi or Qigong, things like that, which they've never done before. But we want to teach them ways to, um, a lot of them have a lot of anxiety um, and when they're triggered and ways that they can help themselves when they become triggered. And it's just a blessing to be able to um, show them different techniques, alternative medicine, everything. We do essential oils, everything like that. Go to the next one. Go 
This was our advanced retreat. We've had wow. one so far. Uh, we were blessed by a resort in Punta Cana and a, a nonprofit in New York City to take 18 survivors and 10 volunteers to Punta Cana um, and for an advanced retreat. And we talked about forgiveness and trust, um, hard stuff, you know. Um, they got massive uh, massage packages, but then they went to the pool, you know, and there were strangers there. And how do you handle that? Like, that's really important to be able to live in this world with our trauma and our hurts, but still be able to function. Um, one of the survivors there, she had not been on a plane since the time that she had been abducted and taken on a plane to another country um, and trafficked. And yet she came and she did it. Another survivor um, had been trafficked at a beach and said she would never set her feet in sand again. And she came and she did it. Um, the picture of the lady on the right, her name is Joyce Haskett Dixon. You can look her up online. Um, she is probably 65 years old. She's from Detroit, Michigan, and she was sentenced to life in prison for killing her pimp. I'll just let that sit with you for a while. Life in prison for killing her pimp. After 17 years in prison and raising her children, she finally got out. Now she is a licensed uh, therapist, um, helps other survivors and clients heal. And she is uh, just an amazing, amazing woman. And this is what healing looks like. To give this gift to survivors, um, is the greatest gift that I could ever receive. Right now, we're planning for another retreat. I have <laughs> having problems raising money because it takes a lot of money to do this. We don't go camping. We don't do bunk beds. Um, and um, I want it to be an alumni retreat from all the ladies that have attended prior. Uh, and it's probably about 70, probably about 50 survivors. Uh, and looking for places, and that means plane tickets and everything, because we provide this completely free for them and remove every um, barrier that they might have. Go to the next one. So what can you do just real fast? Because I do want to get to your questions as well. Um, <laughs> get out of your comfort zone. This isn't an easy subject. It's not easy for me to just share my story and do this all the time. You know, it's a hard, but it's really, really important to talk about this issue. You know, getting your kids passwords, talking to your younger siblings, um, your cousins, things like that, your parents, um, telling your parents, you know, check your younger, um, your younger siblings beds at night. If my parents had checked my bed at night, I wouldn't be here tonight talking to you. Right. And then just trusting your gut instinct. If you see a situation and you feel something is wrong, you're probably right. Um, make a phone call. And I have the hotline number on here. You can call 911 if it's a dangerous situation. Who cares if you're wrong? I, I, I don't care. But what happens if you're right? You might have just saved someone's life. Um, really important getting security systems on houses, cell phone trackers are like $10 a month to get that, uh, especially for kids to know where they are. Um, these are things that we just really need to get back in the groove of doing. Uh, go to the next one. Um, magazines and um, are, are one of my uh, pet peeves, seeing uh, magazines with uh, kids idols. Them and then talking all about orgasms and sex um, and things that they can't comprehend. All right. Uh, it's really the sexualization of our society. As much as people think that it's freeing of us, I think that it also has made everyone extremely vulnerable. Um, writing your senators and representatives and asking for better, stronger laws, asking them to go after the Johns um, more, that's really essential. Um, hosting movie nights, uh, talking to men and boys about strip clubs and bachelor parties. This uh, Grand Theft Auto Vice is the worst, absolutely the worst game out there. I know there's quite a few bad ones, um, but this is probably the second or third most popular game now. Um, and you can actually go on and buy a prostitute, um, have sex with her in a car, and the car will go up and down. You can kill her and get your money back, and your lifeline goes back up. 
I mean, we, the, we have young kids playing this game. You can go to a strip club and get a lap dance. Like, research these things because um, this is where society's going if we don't do something. Um, you go to the next one. So think about it after tonight. Just think about how can you make your mark, right? This is just how I made my mark, right? Um, there's lots of creative ways out there. I was talking earlier about a lady that wants to um, have a ranch and for a, th a therapeutic ranch in Montana where uh, survivors that are just out of the life come for 90 days for healing, you know. Um, it, there's so many opportunities, uh, social enterprises, teaching survivors different things, having a social enterprise and donating the money to a nonprofit. Um, just start to think about what can you do? And it might just be telling people tonight on Facebook or on Instagram what you heard, all right? It might just be that. Um, I will type in here too our Instagram so you can follow us. Um, but really simply just kind of think about what can you do to make your mark? Go to the next one. And I just always ask people, um, it's just to be someone's angel. Um, somebody was my angel and that's why I'm here today. Um, this is the National Human Trafficking Hotline number, and it doesn't take much to be someone's angel. It just takes some guts. It just it just takes a voice to say, hey, can I help you? Um, and then know what to do if they say yes. So I just ask everyone, please, you know, be someone's angel. Go to the next one. And then that's it. These are my three books. Um, the middle one. 10 year anniversary, um, not just my story, but um, how I got from there to here today um, and what it took and it had the effects that trauma had on me. And then the one on the left is the student's guide. <clears throat> it's great for middle school on up on labor and sex trafficking globally and locally. So I think with that, I'm going to take a breath and you guys can ask me whatever questions that you want. Uh, for Lisa, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you for sharing your story and um, sharing some really useful information about, you know, red flags and what to look out for. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll open it up for questions um, for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, but, yes, I just wanted to, to say thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Somebody asked if it was recorded. I believe it is. I think you answered that. I do have a, um, a, a TED talk that you can see, um, and it's pretty old, but um, it's a TEDx talk. You can just put my name in there and you can see that as well. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, so Montana has its own human trafficking hotline number. So um, let me just say that that's great um, that they have their own. I tend to use the national human trafficking hotline where because a lot of times these women are very mobile. They go from state to state. Um, though there's a lot of problems with the national number two. So, you know, just try your best <clears throat> getting a hold of somebody. If you see a situation, if it looks violent right at the moment, call 911. So, which countries use the Nordic bot model? Um, Sweden is the first one that had started that. Um, Norway, I believe, does now. Um, Iceland, I believe, as well. So um, it's something that I, I don't know every country that does. I believe Israel might be one of them, um, but they have been using it um, for quite a long time. Um, and the, the success has been wonderful. There's people say the downside to it or that it will drive the um, trafficking below ground, um, make it more underground and harder to, to reach. Um, but it's already underground. Um, you know, it's, it's already it's all around us. So um law enforcement you know any kind of tool that's going to help law enforcement to go after these guys and in, in the legal uh realm to prosecute people is, is a good thing so <clears throat> it's you know the best thing that we have so thank you well you guys can ask me anything that you want to anything about my story well speak on some of the 
ways survivors' voices are exploited in the market? Oh, man, fantastic question. So she asked, if I could speak on the ways that <clears throat> some of the ways survivor voices are exploited in the market of human trafficking. Um, that is something we have definitely seen. Um, it's such, such a, a crime, right? Um, many organizations, not many, there are organizations, churches too, that will have, um, um, will have survivors speak um, and then not pay them, um, not, um, I don't know, and then just kind of not protect them as well. Um, as you can imagine, I can, you know, there's a lot of odd questions that in an audience. So can you imagine being in a big church, you know, doing my story? And then there's people that can ask some pretty inappropriate questions. I've had it at high schools too. Um, and I was thankful at that time that I was ready to answer those questions, right? Had I not been, I understand, um, especially working with a lot of survivors, how traumatic that can be. Um, it can actually lead to overdose and suicide attempts because they're not ready for that. So it is definitely the responsibility of the person booking the survivor um, or, you know, or an organization um, to making sure that that survivor is ready emotionally to handle it. And she might say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. But, you know, really being able to tell if she is or not is hard. We would like to start a speakers bureau um, where we can vet that and guarantee that this person and kind of have a mentor walk along with them um, because a lot of times um, they're uh, they are abused you know emotionally um, I and I can tell you that I was on the 700 club and actually you can go on to my trafficfree.com website and it's still on there it was the hor most horrific interview I've ever done and I put it, I keep it on there so people can see what not to do. Um, they showed a video that I did not know that they were showing, caught me off guard. And then Pat Robertson sat right next to me, you know, this grandpa of Christianity. And he said, so I heard you were tied up, um, burned with cigarettes and raped over and over again. And he, he's like this close to my face. I, like, what do, what do you say? Like, why I wasn't expecting that one out of the gate, you know, and I luckily had had some good media training and I was able to kind of redirect it. Um, and the whole interview was horrific. And when I got, and I'm thinking in my chair, I'm thinking I could just get up and leave. Like, why don't I just get up and leave? Like this, why am I, why am I letting this happen to me? Like, why don't I just, why don't I just like leave? No, I can't leave because I'm here to represent, you know, my company and because I need to do this. I need to make people aware. And it's going back and forth in my head. And then as I left, after the interview was over, I was like, oh, my gosh, thank you so much, God, that that was me sitting there as a 45 year old woman and not a 20 year old that had just come out of the life. Because I guarantee you, she wouldn't be here today. So I hope that answers your questions. We have to be really careful of how we, um, how we, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of the right word, um, use survivors' voices, all right, only in a positive, empowering way and make sure that they're ready for that. And that's, that's the case for any woman empowerment for voices, actually. So I hope that answered it. Um, was it hard to tell your kids your story? Absolutely hard. Um, I avoided it at all costs and that was not the best approach. Um, I uh, did an interview on TV when my book first came out and it was a news, 10 o'clock news, not thinking that they would see it, not realizing that they have friends and their parents watch the news. And so they're like, mom, we need to talk. This is my two teenage daughters. So really hard to talk about, you know, being raped and, and, you know, sexual abuse and stuff like that with your teenage girls, you know, super hard. Um, my son, he didn't know for many years, he knew that I would go and do talks and I would sell books. And when I would come home, we'd go out for sushi and he might get a new pair of shoes and that he didn't care, you know. Um, but we went on a trip one time to Colorado and he came with me and I was doing talks all across the country, across the state. And he overheard me on the radio. And he, when I saw him in his eyes, I knew, I knew that he knew. And all he said is, 
why why would somebody do this to a person and i'm like that's all i want you to always remember is that you know so really difficult but now they are my biggest champions um my daughter samantha who's my oldest she's 27 she works for me part-time for the soap project she does all of our soap coordination um while she's going to college to <clears throat> masters of education and uh, Elena has helped uh, and Trey, they all have been a really major part of this. My husband, who we've been married six years, um, and he is my rock and helps me in every way with my mission. So finally, um, let's see. What are some tough questions you received? Okay, so that one was the other one, <coughs> not that question. One was, um, do you have any sexually transmitted diseases? That was a lovely question that I got. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. Things not to ask somebody. Uh, a lot of times people will say, um, do you know their names? And it, it's funny because like, I, I take it as like, I don't know, me myself, I take it as like, well, it didn't really happen to you unless you can tell us their names. And maybe that's just me, right? In a, in a trauma moment. Um, but, and, and sometimes I say, well, you know, tell us our names. I, I don't have to, and I'm protecting my, my family by not. Um, but then some other people, like mostly men will come up and say, like, if you tell me their names, I can take care of this for you, you know? And so, you know, it, everybody has a different reaction. So very, I do a whole presentation for survivors and for people that work with survivors on what not to do. <laughs> so, uh, Let's see. How do we pr balance promoting sexual freedom, empowerment, and not shaming for sex, which uh, and not promoting a culture that overlooks issues like sexual trafficking and exploitation? You know, that is a phenomenal question. I wish that I knew the answer to that because um, it would cure everything. Cure everything. Really difficult to balance that, isn't it? Um, I do talk to high schools, and sometimes when I talk to the um, to them about, you know, Bratz dolls and these LOL dolls and just the whole, you know, Cosmopolitan uh, magazines and stuff, I get a lot of kickback um, from the the young feminist today. I get a lot of kickback from them saying, "Well, we should be able to wear what we want. We should be able to." um you know be promiscuous if we want and sell our bodies and you know i'm a libertarian and i, and I have no problem with if you want to do whatever you want to do with your body right but we also there's a balance of men should not be buying you all right because that's slavery and that's what is it that <clears throat> happened in our lives as women as children that said this is a viable option of a career for us you know, you meet that are like our strippers. Oh, I just want to be a stripper. Nobody wants to be a stripper. You know, what happened younger? Let's look at this as the counselor and me. What, let's look and see what happened younger to make you think that that was going to be better than being a baker or being a teacher or a, a doctor, you know? So, um, and I hope that makes sense. It's really tough balancing that issue because I'm always going to offend somebody. Um, and, and I wish that we weren't so sensitive on that issue. So you, know, you look at Amsterdam, right? And Amsterdam thought that they were going to fix this by making sex, you know, workers be able to come and, and sell their bodies and everything was going to be great. <clears throat> you can do this if you want to. Um, and I've heard lately a lot of the Amsterdam um, uh, representatives, the senators, I think they're uh, higher ups, are really unhappy with the way that things are there. Um, it has really made their um, town, I want to say dirty. It's, um, you know, they've legalized marijuana there, uh, prostitution is legal, and it has really affected their uh, reputation and the things that are happening there. And they're actually talking about changing some of those things as well. So you have to be careful when you say, oh, well, let's just legalize something because it's freedom for everybody. You have to be careful when you do that. Uh, campgrounds, I mentioned, yes, uh, we're particularly in tune to the Yellowstone. Um, 
Yeah, so looking for red flags while people are traveling, especially this summer, is going to be really important because this summer, I think everything hopefully will get lifted right from COVID and people are going to be really wanting to travel. Um, <clears throat> I think getting um, red flags like the hotline number out and maybe you guys do this already into the um, rest stop area bathrooms, but also camp giving them to campgrounds to the bathrooms. Um, is something that was a, a thought that a few people have had, um, but definitely getting into the campgrounds because there's not a whole lot of hotels right out there by you guys. You know, in some of the areas, the more your populated areas, sure, but in the rural areas, um, there's not a lot of hotels, but there people are staying somewhere. So really needing to get into those hotels. Have I noticed um, a big difference with COVID because of what's trafficking? Um, it definitely has risen and it's definitely changed. Um, so it's definitely gone underground, obviously, um, but it has not it has not gone away. Unfortunately, it has gotten worse. The like I said earlier, the um, pornography usage um, has skyrocketed. And um, they are making arrangements in hotels and motels, mostly the, the low end motels, because it was hard to book high end motels for a while. Um, so more of the low end motels, we are seeing it happening. The, the biggest effect that I have seen, though, is in the effect for the survivors, um, because being isolated like everybody was, um, no support system, not being able to go out like you have to stay inside or you have to wear a mask, like those are very triggering things to someone that's experienced trauma. Um, so we have seen a huge decline um, in mental health for survivors this past year. Uh, and so, and we've been doing more Zoom with them, uh, more phone calls, sending cards in the mail, you know, just everything that we can um, to reach out to them so that they feel that they're connected. Um, so it has been really detrimental, you know, again, with like nursing homes and stuff like that, what the same with trauma victims as well. Okay, Ellie, do you see any others? Um, I don't see any others. I see Tara um, included the task forces um, website in the chat there. So um, that's an additional resource for people to check out as well. Um, but yeah, any last minute questions that people have, feel free to put those in the chat. I see one there from from Jim, if you want to answer that one. Um, do you work? To, do you work to get your message into high schools? Yeah, um, I've been fortunate to go to a lot of high schools, middle schools, not so much, which is really where it's needed. Um, mostly because I have a license of social work and a master's in education. So I've been fortunate um, to be able to get into high schools and, and do presentations. I actually was able to go in Santa Fe to speak to a, a Native American high school. It was a, not just a high school, it was a where they live there, like a residential um, school. And that was really awesome. Um, but I mean, obviously now, no, you know, um, they're not even doing Zoom, these kind of uh, topics is at all, even right now. But they, they just, they all need it. There are some good prevention programs out there now. Uh, UNITAS, it's, you. Uh, I'll just put it in here. Uh, you, they have a fantastic um, program. That's uh, for prevention. There's a few out there, but every school, again, you really needs to have prevention on this issue. Um, and like I said, colleges as well need to have it. So it's something like I said, I've been doing this for 12 years and we're still really behind the eight ball on this issue, which is uh, this is the second leading crime in the country. This is the second leading crime. And like, we should be hearing about this on the news every night. Like we should be sick of this issue, right? I mean, we all know about drug trafficking. We all know about drugs, right? We see all these TV shows and everything. Now the human trafficking shows are starting to, to get more popular. But again, they're all immigrants, migrants from other countries, labor trafficking, you very rarely, and I saw somebody put on here, like, it's interesting to hear my angle of it. Yeah, it, it, you don't see and hear my angle of it very often which I think is important, um, you don't hear of that white middle-class suburban girl being trafficked in high school with two parents, right? Um, but what I love, I really want people to understand is that 
this happens across the board, all right, uh, to immigrants, to, um, to Native Americans, to um, inner city, minority, it, it knows no bounds. So um, there are a lot of different angles. But the most important thing to remember is that as different as all of our stories are, it, they're all similar. All of our stories, all, there's a similar thread into every single one of our stories, right? Um, and that's what we need to remember. Um, and we really just need to, you know, get this message out there because it, it, this is ridiculous that this is the second leading crime. This is a women's rights issue. Um, and, and it needs to be promoted. Like the UN needs to start promoting this. And the UN needs to talk about this all the time. So that's all I got, guys.